If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 10. We're going to pick up where we left off back in early December as we broke away for Christmas and New Year's. We're going to finish up over these next three or four weeks our study of the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. It's been a great study, and now we're into the armor of God, the supernatural battle that's going on. We're going to be taking a look at that because it's so important for a Christian to know the reality of the battle in which we live and in which we fight every day that we awake. We're going to take a look at three verses in Ephesians 6, and then we're going to go to the 26th chapter of the book of Matthew and look at what happened. We talked about a few weeks ago what happens when the kingdom of light enters the kingdom of darkness, Jesus in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Last week, then, we saw what happened when he encountered evil Now we're going to take a look this morning at the nature of evil, God and the devil, part one, and see what happened when evil began to escalate the war against absolute good. We'll do that in just a moment. That's the plan. But as always, before we talk about the sun, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his father first. Father, we thank you for loving us and sending Jesus to die in our place We thank you for all that's ours as a Christian, but you never promised us that it would be a walk through a rose garden. In fact, you had a sign on for just the opposite, that we are to deny ourselves, pick up a cross, and follow you daily. And so it means that we're going to have battles. We have the ultimate victory given to us already. The promised land is there for us to claim it's our home, but on the road to getting there, we're going to have to conquer evil every day. I pray, my prayer for this study is that you will make us aware of the enemy, make us aware of the supernatural battle that we fight. If we don't know there's a battle going on, Satan has already won that battle with us. So make us street smart. Let us be one step ahead of our enemy because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we open your word this morning, we ask you to come in a powerful way. We pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth, and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Ephesians 6, 10, 11, and 12. Follow along with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I thought it was. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's talking about the supernatural battle. Let's go over and see what happened to Jesus right before the crucifixion. Matthew 26, verse 1 through 5. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people." Now, in just a moment, we're going to talk about the nature of evil. But before we do that, there are two sore thumbs that stick out of this text that we need to take a look at on the front end. So let's do that quickly. Sore thumb number one, I want you to please note the King James phrase, and it came to pass. Now, in the passage that we just read, Matthew 26, verse 1, it says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things. If you have a King James Bible, and when I study during the week, I read five different translations in order to get all the information that I might teach it to you. When I did that this week, I saw that it starts out this way, and it came to pass. And it came to pass. I remember that phrase from when I was just a little boy in school, in Sunday school, remembering that from Luke 2, from the birth narrative of Jesus. And it came to pass at Caesar Augustus, issued a decree, and so I got curious this week, and I got out my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, 
And I wanted to look up the number of times that that phrase appears in the King James Bible. It came to pass. And when I got to 400, I gave up and stopped counting because there were a lot more left and it was a waste of time. I'm going to tell you what I'm about to say won't hold up under a Greek word study. In fact, what I'm about to say is taken completely out of context. But what do I know? I never went to Bible college. But there is biblical significance in those four words. It came to pass. Jokingly, I've said that's a verse that I've claimed for those of you who've had kidney stones. But I want you to know I've claimed it a lot more than just for kidney stones. I've claimed it for those of you who are battling cancer. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. For those of you who are going through the pain and suffering of the loss of a loved one. For those of you who are going through the broken heart of a divorce, the humiliation of an addiction, financial problems, family problems, sin problems. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. And things will never again be exactly as they are right now. You know, we're always trying to reproduce feelings and emotions and situations in our lives, aren't we? I mean, isn't that what our high school reunions are all about? Going back for one night and, and trying to live the good old days, trying to relive for maybe just a few hours the glory days. This fall, we had the opportunity to go back to Southside Christian Church, the first church that we pastored, and go to homecoming there. And it was a wonderful experience. They treated us like royalty, and we had so much fun. And we kept hearing from the people who were there. Those were the days. And they've never been the same since. Those were the good old days. Well, I want you to know that those days didn't come to stay. Those days came to pass. And that's what's wrong with a lot of our Christian churches today. They're stuck in the 40s, the 50s, or the 60s, or the 70s unwilling to embrace the change today that it takes to become a church in the culture of 2015. Do you remember the transfiguration of Jesus up on the mountain? He takes Peter, James, and John, goes up on the mountain. He's transfigured to his heavenly glory. It's a wonderful moment. The top of the Mountain shines like lightning. Moses and Elijah show up to encourage Jesus. It's right before his trip to the cross. And the Bible says, Peter says, not knowing what to say, Peter said. Seemed like the only time Peter opened his mouth was to change feet sometimes. But he tried to take something that was passing and fleeting and make it permanent. He said, Lord, do you want me to build three shelters up here? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. That moment on top of the mountain didn't come to stay. It came to pass. We need to learn to kiss the joy as it passes by. Don't try and hold on. Let it go because it came to pass. Remember the movie, The Dead Poet Society? Remember the mot motto of the movie, Carpe Diem? Seize the day. Why are we to seize the day? Because that day didn't come to stay. That day came to pass. Tomorrow will be a new day. Couples come sometimes with marriage problems, and they say to us, we've been trying to recreate the feelings and the romance we had when we first got married. We say, that's the problem. You're not still 19 or 20 years old with stars in your eyes walking off into the sunset. God's got new romance and new feelings for your relationship. You know, at 8 o'clock on Sunday night, is like a holiday with me. My week is built from... Monday, all the way as a crescendo to Sunday morning. I sit in the study. God gives me a message to give to you. When I finish it on Friday, I get so excited. When I practice it on Saturday, I get really excited. And then I love coming in here on Sunday morning and giving you what God has given me. And then if we have an activity that night, by 8 o'clock, we're home and the evening's over. And it's like a holiday to me. My only day off is on Monday. We sleep in late on Monday morning. But you know, on Sunday night, after that 8 o'clock rolls around, I find myself getting out a pencil and a piece of paper, looking at next week's text, and I write down an outline. And then on Monday, Lev and I go sit somewhere, and we go and look at the outline and begin to put down our thoughts, illustrations for the sermon for the next day, and it begins to build again. Because you see, last week came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It's kind of like at the dentist when he hands you the cup and says, rinse and spit because we're done. 
Whatever you're facing right now, understand that it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. So with them, number two, I want you to please note that Jesus prepares those who belong to him. Verse two, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. As you go through the Gospel of Matthew, you see how Jesus prepares his disciples for the bad stuff, just as he prepares us for the bad stuff. I want to read you two verses from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus has just told the disciples about some terrible things that will happen to them when he's gone. And in verse 4, he says, I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. Verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome this world. Jesus is in the business of preparing those who belong to him. Bad things really do happen to good people. Bad things really do happen to God's people. But be ready, because you've been warned and prepared ahead of time. This is a stinking world that we live in, a fallen world that we inherited. It's an evil world. So be prepared, because every day the world turns upside down on top of someone who was sitting on top of it yesterday. I remember the conversation that I had with God when my parents were involved in the accident. I said, God, I don't know if I can trust you. My father's dead, my mom is critical, and you let it happen, and you act like you don't care. And the father said to me, Bill, would you trust me more if I lied to you? I said, what? He said, would you trust me more if I lied to you? I mean, if I told you that life was a party, and you lived in a world where everything was always going to turn out right and you would never be sad, would you trust me more if I lied to you? And I said, no, I'd probably trust you a lot less than I do now. And then he said, have I ever lied to you? And I said, no, not that I know. You've never lied to me. And he said, have I ever given you any indication that I love you? I said, yes, a number of times, and one major time on a cross when you let your son die in my place. And then the father said, if you've got my love and you've got my honesty, you ought to trust me. And that brings me to a principle, and I want you to remember it so that you can apply it in your life. When love is present with truth, trust is warranted. Say it again. When love is present with truth, trust is warranted. Let me tell you something, you're going to come to me sometime with questions I can't answer. Because I have questions I can't answer. Why do babies die? Why do marriages fall apart? Why do people lose their job? Why health problems? But when you come to me with questions like that, I'm going to give you the same answer I give myself. I don't know. I don't know, but I do know this, that God is too kind to do anything cruel. He's too wise to make a mistake. And he's too deep to explain himself. And sometimes we have to look at his honesty and his love and trust him for the rest. Why? Because he loved us enough to die for us. He cared enough to prepare us ahead of time. And he promised us it wouldn't be forever. Someday, and I believe soon, he's coming back to take us home. All right, with those two appetizers out of the way, on to the main course for this morning. God and the devil and the nature of evil. As I said before, if you don't believe that there is a devil, Satan has already won the battle with you. Kyle, could you run that clip? Do you believe in the devil? Uh, do I believe in the devil? <laughs> I don't think so. Do you believe in the devil? No. No, I don't believe in the devil. I just never really bought into all that, I guess. I'm not sure if there's an actual, like, Satan or hell. I'd rather not believe in the devil. I'd prefer God. No, I don't think I believe in the devil. Can you tell me why not? Um, there's really nothing written or documented about it. How do you know he exists if there's nothing you can believe in God? Because, you know, there's the Bible and all that about it, but there's nothing about the devil. Tell me why not. I don't necessarily believe in God either, I mean, so 
There's no God, there's no devil. Actually, um, I don't really believe in God too, so why believe in devil if I don't believe in God? Do you believe in the devil? Yes, I believe in the devil. If it's a God, it's got to be a devil. Do you believe in the devil? Yes, I do. Not a physical devil. Do I believe in the devil? I believe in the presence of evil. I'm not sure if that's personified in the devil or not, but I do believe that there is evil present in the world. I guess the angel Gabriel was supposed to be Satan. Uh, he was turned into Satan, he was banished to hell, and uh, that's probably where evil came from, you know? What, what, do you think, what do you think he looks like, if he's real? Um, scary looking. <laughs> Red, black, I don't know. Everyone has their image of what the devil looks like, which is, you know, this a creature with horns and you know everything but I don't think no one knows what devil looks like. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is you know the big red guy with the pointy pointy tail and the horns and the pitchfork and stuff. I don't really think he's got a form just like just darkness. What is his purpose? His purpose? No that's a good question. That I don't know. It's like yin and yang there has to be a balance there so he's there to balance out the good that's out there. I don't know because I think everything has its opposite and he's just the opposite of godliness and goodness. How do you know the devil doesn't exist? Well I don't really know I mean <laughs> who really knows. It's just uh, you gather information around you and make your own decisions. I don't know that's exactly I don't know if there is a God, I don't know if there, you know, is a devil, I don't know if there's hell, you know, it could be, it could not be. How do you know there isn't a devil? I don't know that something like that doesn't exist, and while I'm willing to entertain the idea that it does exist, I don't personally believe that it exists. I'm not really a big religious person, so, I don't know, I'm sort of, like, eh, on the whole God-Devil deal, I'm just, I don't know, I'm not... I don't worry about it. How do you know there isn't a devil? Uh, I don't really like know that one doesn't exist, but to me there's just been there's been nothing to prove that there was some like outward force that caused people to do something. It was just themselves working for their own personal gain, I guess. So that doesn't concern you at all? Um I wouldn't say I wouldn't wasn't concerned, just I don't know, I have honestly better things to worry about. They're in a war, and they don't even know that there's an enemy. This morning, I want to continue doing something that I've done many times in the past and probably will never stop doing, and that is educating you about and preparing you for the supernatural battle between the forces of good, the forces of evil, between God and Satan, the angels and the demons, between us and the devil. One of the major advantages to being successful in a battle is being to I able to identify the enemy and being able to understand the enemy. And so the subject before the house this morning, how to better understand the nature of evil. For those keeping score, I've got five points. We're going to move quickly. Here we go. First of all, I want you to note that evil is endemic. In other words, it's native to us, the human species. Verses three and four. Then the chief priests and elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. Now you need to know that these guys were the upper echelon of society. These were the religious folks. They were the leaders of their community. To say the least, they were people you expected better from. They were the people who were good and pure and righteous. And they were trying to trick Jesus, the Son of God, into killing. And you know what surprises me about Christians? that Christians are surprised about evil. It really surprises me that Christians are surprised about evil. Did you hear about the city slicker who was visiting his hillbilly friend who owned a hog farm down in Tennessee? They were out walking over the farm and the city slicker stopped and he said, man, would you look at that? That is the strangest looking pig I've ever seen in my life. Why, that pig's got a wooden leg. What in the world happened to that pig? And the farmer said, well, that's a very special pig. One night that pig woke us up squealing to high heaven, busted down the front door, ran into our bedroom. 
It was only then that we noticed that our house was on fire. That pig saved our lives. And then another time, my tractor turned over on top of me and pinned me to the ground. There was nobody around. I thought I was a goner for sure, and here came that old pig, grunting and pushing and rooting until he got that tractor off of me. And the city slicker said, but what about the wooden leg? How did he lose his leg? And the hillbilly said, man, you crazy or something? You don't eat a pig that special all at one time. <laughs> now, we think that's funny, but the point is this. All of us are capable of eating the family pig. Because evil is endemic. It's a part of human nature because we live in a fallen world. And you shouldn't be surprised by evil. A week ago, Thursday morning, we woke up in Florida and watch the news. We were stunned and in shock, and we shouldn't have been. But we were, and so was the whole St. Pete, Tampa community. Because a 25-year-old father had thrown his 5-year-old daughter off of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge about midnight that night. Here we had Caleb, our five-year-old grandson, and we just could not fathom. I hate that bridge. I hate going over that bridge because it's so high. And here he threw his little girl, five years old, off into the ocean below. They found her body the next day. We shouldn't be surprised by evil. I've said it a million times, let me say it again, that if you look at somebody else's evil and sin and disobedience and you point the finger and criticize and you judge that brother or sister, then you don't understand the first thing about the Christian faith of the supernatural battle. It's when you see someone else's evil and sin and you say, my God, it could have been me that you begin to understand. Except for the grace and the mercy of God, my God, it could have been me. And if you've come to this place this morning to rub elbows with saints and good people, you've come to the wrong place. We're a hospital for sinners. By the grace of God, we're getting better, but every single one of us is a sinner. And if you think that evil doesn't concern you, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. Evil is a part of you. It's a part of me, and we will fight it every day of our lives until God calls us home or until Jesus comes back. And if you're surprised by the evil in you or anybody else, then you need to take off your Disney World blinders and wake up and face reality. I've often said to you, if you knew what I've done and said and thought this week, you wouldn't want me up here teaching you the Bible. But the reverse holds true. If I knew what you'd done and said and thought this week, I wouldn't want to be up here teaching you the Bible. Last summer, right before we started our study in the book of Ephesians, I did a sermon from 1 Peter on loving the unlovely. How to love people who are unlovable. A few days later that week, I got a letter in the mail from a young boy in this congregation. I want to read it to you. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but I want to read it to you. Dear Pastor Bill, last Sunday in your sermon, you said we have to love turkeys and twits and people we don't even like. Because you said that, now I have to love girls. Sick! Exclamation point. I don't want to love girls. I'm going to love puppies instead. I love Jesus, Jesus loves girls, and Jesus loves me and everyone, and that ought to be enough. You're a good preacher, but there are a lot of turkeys I don't like. Girls, yuck! Exclamation point. The end. Yours truly. And then he signed his name. <laughs> After I stopped laughing, I thought, you know, that little guy's got some anger inside towards girls. And I know some turkeys I don't like either. And something inside me wells up because evil is endemic. It's a part of me and it's a part of you. And the only difference between us and the world out there is that we know it. And God's grace is beginning to change us little by little. So Christians, don't be surprised by evil. Be prepared for evil. It's coming. And secondly, I want you to know that evil is not only endemic, but it's engineered or planned. Verses 3 and 4. Then the chief priest and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas. 
And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. Let me tell you something. Evil, by its very nature, is disorganized. You know why? Because evil manifests itself in ego. And ego will not get organized unless ego is the leader. And so the nature of evil is to kind of scatter all over the place. In Frank Peretti's books, he portrays the demons as always being jealous of one another. Selfish and greedy and hateful. Always prideful. Wanting their name above everybody else's name. I've told you before about the business consultant who came to Atlanta Saw to help us run a more efficient company. And I asked him, how do you go into a company you know nothing about and find a problem? And he said this, you always look for the ego, and wherever you find the ego, there you'll find the problem. Well, ego is the epitome of evil. Because Jesus said to follow me, you've got to what? Deny yourself. Be willing to pick up a cross daily and follow me. Evil is ego-centered. It's selfish. It's individualistic. And it has a hard time organizing. You see, there's something about the personality of evil that's disorganized. Evil can't get together except in one place. And that brings me to a principle, and it is this. Evil will organize when the prize is the destruction of good. Let me say it again. Evil will organize when the prize is the destruction of good. Pilate and Herod were two of the biggest twits and tyrants the world had ever known. They were bitter enemies until they met Jesus. Do you remember? Jesus was brought to Pilate. And Pilate thought, you know, I don't need any more trouble. I got enough trouble living here under a microscope in Jerusalem. I don't need any more trouble. And then Pilate thought about Herod. And he thought to himself, you know, Herod's in Jerusalem. And this Jesus, he's a Galilean. I'm going to send him over to Herod and let Herod handle the problem. And so Pilate sends Jesus over to Herod. Herod mocks and ridicules Jesus, sends him back to Pilate. And then Luke makes an editorial comment there in his gospel. Listen as I read it to you. Luke 23, verse 12. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. For before this, they had been enemies. What got them together? Jesus got them together. What gets evil together today? Let me tell you, you guys do. Jesus in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what gets evil together still today. Jesus of Nazareth. Satan was beaten by the blood of a Nazarene carpenter. He was stomped into the ground by an empty tomb. And he can't stand his defeat. And so he still goes after Jesus today in all of us. And get used to it. Because it's going to be that way until Revelation 20.10 becomes reality. And Satan is thrown into the lake of fire by the Son of God. So remember that evil is generally disorganized except in the destruction of God's people and good. So you need to recognize that evil is engineered. Be ready. Be careful. Thirdly, I want you to see evil is not only endemic and engineered, but it's also elusive. Verse 4. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way. That means by trickery. And kill him. Verse 5. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. You know... <clears throat> Evil never announces itself as evil. In fact, just the opposite. It walks right through the front door disguised as good. It's no accident that in the 14th chapter of Isaiah, Lucifer, the angel of darkness, is referred to as the angel of light. He's referred to as the morning star, something very, very attractive. When Hart wrote his book, The Success Factor, the book was about failure. He went to his publisher, and the publisher told him, you can't use the word failure in the title of your book. If you do, nobody's going to buy the book. And so he entitled it The Success Factor. Evil likes to do that because it's elusive. Evil likes to disguise itself as good in order to deceive. Evil likes to tell you how wonderful it is. For instance, we don't call it filth. We call it freedom of speech. We don't call it pornography, we call it freedom of the press. We don't call it a baby, we call it a fetus or tissue. We don't call it murder or abortion, we call it choice. We don't call it paganism, we call it free thinking. We don't call them 
drunks or addicts anymore. They're substance abuse victims. We don't even call it evil anymore. We call it anything but evil, but never evil. But let me tell you something, folks. It is evil. And disguising it by any other name doesn't change the evil essence of what it really is. People who don't travel think that traveling is very glamorous. And it can be for about two or three months. For three and a half years, I traveled all over the continent of North America full time, four weeks out of the month. Home was another stop on the trip every two weeks to wash clothes, pay the bills, and then back on the road. When Andy was two years old, he told his nursery school teacher that his daddy lived at the airport because that's where they picked me up and took me back to. I was in 48 states, Mexico, 11 provinces in Canada, and people used to say to me, Bill, you got it made. All that travel, all that glamour. But you see, they didn't see the loneliness. They didn't see the 14 cities in 12 days and two flights a day and different rental car every day, new hotel room every night, living in a world full of strangers. And then I'd put on my suit and put on my smile and go conduct business. And all night long, I'd be thinking about love and the boys wishing I was home. All I wanted to do was go home. There were nights when I would have paid anything to sleep in my own bed. I would have traded a truckload of restaurant food for one hamburger grilled on my grill. I would have rather been any place with my family than on the road. Let me tell you something, folks. That's the way evil is. It's very attractive. It's very glamorous until you try it out and find out the grass is never greener. And you'd give anything to be someplace else once you give in to evil. I'm attracted to evil, aren't you? And if you said no, you'll lie about other things. I want you to know I'm very attracted to it because it's meant to be attractive. Satan didn't run around in a red suit with horns and tail in a pitchfork and say, Hi, I'm the devil. He sneaks up and he says, Hey, hey, you want to be somebody? Nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever find out. You want to be somebody? You want to be sophisticated and intelligent and rich? Don't you want to be accepted and in control? Then walk away from that religious garbage. Man, give up on those losers. Listen to me, and you're going to be a winner, because I'm going to show you how to be a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, because hell is the truth discovered too late. Fourthly, I want you to see not only is evil endemic, engineered, and elusive, but it's also enlightened, verse 5a. But not during the feast, they said, not during the feast. In other words, they knew the people. And they knew how the people felt about Jesus. They loved Jesus. And so they had to be very, very careful how they plotted their evil. You know, if we knew as much about the pagans as the pagans know about us, we would have won the battle a long time ago. Steve Brown is my mentor and hero. And I've listened to Steve speak hundreds of times. And I'll never forget what he said one year at Praise Gathering when he got up to address 11,000 people. He said, you think that I've come here to make you feel comfortable and entertain you. Well, I haven't. I've come here to bind up your wounds and your broken hearts and teach you about the enemy and send you back into the battle. I like to be comforted. But I want you to know I understand what Steve was saying. That if we don't educate and enlighten ourselves about the enemy and the battle, we will get eaten alive. Do you ever notice there are certain subjects we don't talk about in church? Well, in most churches, ours being a refreshing exception. We want to come here on Sunday and keep it simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Because we don't want our religion to get complicated or involved. And so while we're in here singing our songs, the world is out there thinking and planning and plotting. Too often we think that our Christianity is only in our hearts. But Jesus called us to be thinking Christians too. He gave us a brain. He told us to be as innocent as does, but he also told us to be as shrewd as snakes. Beloved, we are called to be shrewd, smart, thinking Christians who know what this book has to say from cover to cover so that we can answer the questions of the world, so that we can stay one step ahead of the world. 
If we're going to win the battle and win the world for Christ, we've got to know what makes them tick. We've got to understand their problems. We've got to be street smart. For instance, most churches don't like to talk about sex. If the pastor uses the word gay or homosexual or lesbian, everybody winces. If the pastor starts talking about adultery or sexual problems or the lust that every human being faces, then we get nervous. We get uncomfortable. We say, Pastor, please don't, don't be talking about those things. But tomorrow, when you go back to the workplace and the world, that's exactly what they're going to be talking about. And you need to understand, when you go to the water cooler in the morning, that's going to be the topic of the day. In Christianity Today, back in December, they had a bunch of secular news writers give their opinions about the new year. And the religion writer for the Houston Chronicle said this, Sexual issues, abortion, divorce, homosexuality, and others will dominate public discussion in 2015. Unfortunately, secular forces have claimed this territory. For most Christians, human sexuality is still a subject too hot to handle in church. Let me tell you something. If we're going to win the lost to Christ, then we've got to understand the lost, and we've got to understand evil. And remember, remember that evil is enlightened, and we should be enlightened too not with our heads stuck in the ground. Fifthly and finally, and very quickly, I want you to see evil is not only endemic, engineered, elusive, and enlightened, but it's also elitist. Verse 5, But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Tut, tut, is the cry of evil in the world today. Evil would like for you to believe that it offers all the luxuries of a country club, while being a Christian means belonging to a lunatic minority of Jesus freaks. Tut, tut. How could you possibly believe all that nonsense? <laughs> tut, tut. Why spend your life being obedient when you could be having a blast of beer and a blonde? Tut, tut. Don't you know that religion is for losers who couldn't succeed at anything else? And if you want real power and wealth and fame, then join our club because we're elite. We're special. This is an opportunity you don't want to miss. And the sad thing is that a lot of Christians fall for that lie. And they leave the fire, and they go back into the coldness of the world and the darkness. If only Christians understood the arrogance and the elitism of evil, we could burn paganism to rags in our time. We need to, to break our stereotype as wimps and build one as warriors. Let me tell you something. Evil would like for you to believe that it has all the answers and you have nothing. Evil would like for you to believe that it's sophisticated and you're stupid. Evil would like for you to eat, drink, and be merry because you only go around once in life, so grab everything you can grab. Join the country club of evil. But Jesus would tell you that power didn't come from carrying an American Express card. It comes from carrying a cross. Jesus would tell you that wealth didn't come from stocks and bonds. Wealth comes from giving everything you have away. Jesus would tell you that authority doesn't come from clawing your way to the top. Authority comes from taking a towel and a basin of water and washing some feet. I'm here to tell you this morning, it's all about grace. We wouldn't have a prayer without God's grace. You wouldn't have a chance at winning the supernatural battle over evil if it wasn't for God's grace. God loves you just the way you are. And praise God. He doesn't love you as you should be because the truth is you will never be as you should be. That's why we need His grace. That's why it is so amazing. That's why we need to understand this battle and know that there's an enemy and that His name is Satan. Let me finish with this. I just wanted to stop by and give you a little update on what's going on. Now some of you don't have a clue as to who I am. But there's others of you that know exactly who I am. And let's be clear on one thing. I know who you are. I spend as much time as I can with most of you. And here's the part that should make you a little uncomfortable. I spent a lot of time with your children. And thanks to some of you, they don't even know what to look out for. Sure, there's times I, I kind of wish I did the whole horns, pitchfork, and red cape thing, but... You know, that would make it too easy for you guys. You see, the great thing for me is that I don't look like anything. I can look like just about everything. 
I don't have to be here. Some of the best work I do with you people is up here. Now, some of you are thinking, I'm successful, I live a good life, my family's happy, you don't have me. Well, guess what? I can take you down in more ways than you understand. I have one goal, and that's to keep you away from God. And if I can make you miserable in the process, well, bonus for me. And for those of you that don't understand the problem that I have with our Creator, read the book. It's all in there. I want you to think of all the places you've seen me in the past week. TV, newspaper, radio, movies, the internet. <laughs> the internet, wow. Wow, I love that place. Do you know that I have over 420 million pages of porn on that thing? And it does almost $5 billion in revenue a year and growing. Thanks in part to many of you. Let me let you in on a little secret. And I don't mind either. You know why I don't mind? Because most of you will forget everything that was said in this service by the time you walk out those back doors. Are you ready for this? All you have to do is choose to avoid me. You want to know the best thing God ever did for me was to give you the ability to choose? You see, you can't not choose. And here's the greatest thing about it. By not choosing Him, you automatically choose me. Now some of you have figured out how to keep me away. And quite frankly, there's no mystery to it. James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee. But most of you choose to allow me free reign in your life. You know, there's that word again. Choose. I have drugs, porn, infidelity, greed, lust, pride, slander, and the list goes on and on and on. But the one thing I do not have is the ability to offer you freedom. You know, to see Jesus suffer on that cross was one of the greatest moments of my life. Then when he was with me, the burning and the torture that he felt was at my hands. And I loved it. I loved every second of his torture. But you know what I couldn't stop thinking of? I couldn't stop thinking about why he was there. During that time, I could only think of one thing. That when his torment was over, it meant that all of humanity, every one of you, would have the chance for an eternal life of peace. And all you would have to do is simply choose. You know, I know how this is going to end. I know what's in store for me. I will be condemned to an eternal hell, but until that day, I will do everything in my power to unleash that hell on this earth. And as God, as my witness, if you even allow me the smallest corner of your life, I will not stop until I destroy you. And until you cry for mercy in Christ's sake, I will not let you go. When the service is over, I will be waiting. I'll be waiting for some of you at work, at school, or at home. You know, I'll even see some of you in the car outside. Just remember, it's either me or him. Who do you choose? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promises of Scripture, 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Satan is not your equal. He's simply your enemy and our enemy. So teach us to be street smart. Teach us to stay one step ahead. Teach us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in us so we'll know how to fight this battle. And teach us that we can't fight it with natural weapons. It has to be thought, fought with the supernatural weapons the weapons of scripture and prayer, salvation, faith. We love you and we praise you and we pray that you'll walk with us every single day this week until we're back here next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.